Good morning and welcome back. This morning I'd like to continue our discussion of our sensory apparatus by talking about hair cells. Now hair cells have nothing to do with coiffure, they have nothing to do with the kind of hair that I'm increasingly without. Uh, they instead are the cells of the internal ear that are involved in our perception of sound. They're also cells of our vestibular labyrinth that give us our sensitivity to acceleration, both linear accelerations of the sort that ensue when we move straight ahead or the linear acceleration due to gravity, and also angular accelerations of the sort that occur as a result of rotatory movements, either of the head or of the entire body. These hair cells in all these organs are united by a common embryological origin, a common structure, and a common way of carrying out the process of transduction, that is the conversion of this input into an electrical response that's forwarded to the brain. So it makes sense to consider these cells together. The individual hair cell doesn't have the axons and dendrites that true nerve cells have and that I mentioned to you yesterday. It's simply a columnar or sort of bottle-shaped cell like this that has a nucleus at the bottom. It does make synapses of a sort that I described yesterday by which it sends chemical information from its basal surface to these nerve fibers that carry information on into the brain. And the unique striking organelle or structure that gives the hair cell its name is the so-called hair bundle this little cluster of feelers sticking out of the top or apical surface of the cell. You can now see that the hair bundle is this beautifully regular structure that looks something like a pipe organ, and it has a couple of very important features. One is that the processes are not all of the same length, but in every case there's a short edge to the hair bundle, and then the processes get longer as you move across it. This can be seen well by looking at this model of the hair bundle. This bundle, like a real one, has about 60 of these little stereocilia in it and a single canocilium with this ball on the top. And as you can see, when the hair bundle moves side to side, there is a sliding or slipping motion between the tips of the adjacent stereocilia. And we'll later see the importance of that in the transduction process of this particular type of cell. Sound, of course, consists of alternating compressions and rarefactions of the air outside the ear. And those pressure changes are transmitted down the ear canal and impinge upon the flexible eardrum at its end. The eardrum then vibrates back and forth and in turn transmits motion to three little bones of the middle ear, the hammer, anvil, and stirrup, or malleus incus and stapes. And the last of those bones, the stirrup, exerts a back and forth piston-like motion compressing the fluids within the internal ear, or cochlea. Now the cochlea is this coiled, snail-shaped structure that you can see here with about three spiral turns to it. And this whole apparatus is about as big as a chickpea, a garbanzo bean. It's about yay big. You can see coming off the back of the cochlea, the cochlear nerve, and that's of course going to carry information into the brain from uh, the cochlea that gives information about sound. Now let's consider in a little more detail what goes on within the cochlea itself. Excuse me. Unlike a snail, the cochlea does not consist of a single fluid-filled tube, but rather if you cut along the cochlea anywhere along its spiraling length, you can see that it consists of three fluid-filled tubes coiled side by side around a common helical axis, and that's magnified up here. So each of these three compartments is full of salt solution, and these three compartments are separated from, two, from each other by two elastic diaphragms that extend the length of the cochlea. One of these diaphragms, which is called the basilar membrane, has upon it some 16,000 hair cells that extend all the way in rows all the way from the base to the top of the cochlea. Here's an actual basilar membrane dissected from an animal. And you can see the beautiful spiraling basilar membrane moving up the length of the cochlea, rather like the thread on a wood screw. Now let's suppose that we could simplify this structure for the sake of, of uh, analysis. Imagine that you can uncoil the cochlea and simplify it farther by replacing the complex structure with just two fluid-filled compartments separated from each other by a single elastic diaphragm which represents the basilar membrane. When sound pressure increases outside the ear, the eardrum and the little bones of the middle ear are pushed to the right, the stapes increases the pressure in this compartment, and the basilar membrane should be pushed down. If instead there is a rarefaction outside, the bones and the eardrum should be pulled to the left, and the suction that that creates should pull the basilar membrane upward. So you would think if you listen to a pure tone that causes the membrane to vibrate back and forth, that the basilar membrane too would simply oscillate up and down along its length. 
but it isn't that simple. The basilar membrane is not like a simple musical string, like say a single string on the guitar, that always oscillates at a particular frequency. Instead, the basilar membrane changes along its length. At its top end, it's relatively broad and floppy. At its bottom end, it's rather thicker and tauter. So it's really like a string that varies continuously from the highest string on the violin to the lowest string on the bass. And correspondingly, when you play different frequencies, they affect the basilar membrane in different places. For example, if we play a frequency that's relatively low, like 100 cycles per second, that causes a wave of oscillation at this end of the basilar membrane. A high frequency oscillation causes a vibration down here, and any other intermediate frequency will cause an intermediate position of oscillation. So you can see that this structure has a very nice property of breaking down complex sounds, such as my voice, into their constituent components. So if I make a particular sound like ah, that has three dominant frequencies that are called formants in it. And those three frequencies would be represented at different positions along the length of the basilar membrane. Now, we can appreciate how the basilar membrane functions in analyzing still more complicated sounds by means of a video simulation that we'll now play to show what happens when you listen to something really complex. So could we have that, please? So here we are with a view of the cochlea. The cochlea now uncoils, and we look at the basilar membrane, and now see what happens when we play individual tones. Now a chord. And finally, something really complex. kid you not. I mean, this is really what's going on in your ear all the time. It's rather amazing, isn't it? This, for those of you of a mathematical bent, is rather like what's called spectral analysis or Fourier analysis. You break down a waveform into its different sinusoidal components, because each and every waveform that's out there, every sound you can hear, can be described as the sum of a series of sine and cosine waves. And that's exactly what this apparatus does. <laughs> 